Hi, my name is Jerry McLaughlin. I'm the president of Clean TV. I've got a question for you. What could be worse than an Islamic terrorist who hates you and wants to kill you? Answer, a former Islamic terrorist who loves you. Now, why would this be dangerous? Well, not dangerous to you or me, but dangerous to the dogma of terror and hatred that this man used to serve. Our presenter today, Walid Shubat, was a Muslim's Muslim. He was born the grandson of a chieftain, a Muslim chieftain in Bethlehem of Judea. And his grandfather was friends with none other than the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem. Now, the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem was friends with Adolf Hitler and taught Adolf Hitler how to annihilate millions of Jews. Now, Walid started off wanting to make his grandfather proud and following in his footsteps, one day decided to plant a bomb in an Israeli bank. Shortly before it went off, he saw some children, some Arab children playing there, and he didn't want to see them killed, so he ran over, grabbed the bomb, and threw it up onto the roof of the bank. It exploded, but with virtually no damage to the bank. So having failed at his mission, he sought about other ways to fight the Jewish people. One way he came up with was he thought, well, I'll read the Jewish Bible and I'll discredit them intellectually. Well, it got interesting from there because Walid started to read the Jewish Bible and in the middle of it, he had a Damascus Road experience, if you will. He saw the light and today he now serves Yahweh, God of both the Jews and the Christians. It is with great pleasure and my privilege to present to you today a lover of Jews, a lover of Christians, and my friend, Mr. Walid Shubat. Hi, my name is Walid Shubat. I guess I want to talk about a subject that very rarely people like to talk about. Terrorism, fundamental Islam, why they want to do it, why they want to blow themselves up, and what have you. I should know the subject very well. After all, I came from that background. Many people think that, you know, uh, I used to be a fundamentalist Muslim or a Muslim fundamentalist. Let me remind everybody, everybody is a fundamentalist of some sort. Liberals are fundamentally liberal. Conservatives are fundamentally conservative. Uh, you know, everyone is a fundamentalist. Now that I got that out of the way, maybe I can uh, really explain that not all fundamentalists are equal. When I used to be a Muslim fundamentalist, you know, the media called us freedom fighters, and I remember when I shed the mantle of terrorism, I remember walking into the BBC in England for a radio interview. And in that interview, they began to uh, try to tell me and explain to me that the reason that the world has had so much problems with terrorism is because of fundamentalism. That fundamentalists on all sides are a problem in today's society and we, we must eliminate all fundamentalists of any background. So I said, well, excuse me, I am a Christian fundamentalist, I admit that, and I also admit that I give the world a headache. But a Muslim fundamentalist takes the whole head right off. There is a difference between the two. I learned fairly quickly at the BBC, they said, thank you for stopping by, that means get out of the uh, station. And uh, later on, of course, I ran into many in the media, and many in the media asked me silly questions. Uh, the educated especially ask the silliest questions. Uh, usually people who live in farms ask much better questions than the so-called educated. The educated ask me the following question. They say, if you are a confessed terrorist, should you not go to prison? You know, some say there are no stupid questions. Well, I would agree to a certain extent. There are some questions that I consider stupid. One of them is that if I'm a confessed terrorist, PLO terrorist that is, why am I not in prison? Well, the United States of America have accepted the PLO as a viable entity for negotiations, which means PLO terrorists are no longer terrorists. Only Hamas terrorists are now terrorists. I guess there's a difference, and according to the United States government's thinking, that not all terrorists are the same, even though they both plant bombs and they kill innocent people. However, the first question I always like to ask some of these people is the following. 
Why do you always want to imprison repentant terrorists, yet you want to release the real terrorists from Guantanamo Bay? Doesn't that not make any sense to you? Does, does it make any sense that you want to release the real terrorists and arrest repentant terrorists? You know, Hamas and the PLO are the same. In fact, in the PLO, they have what is called Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade. Why would they call them Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigades? What does Al-Aqsa mean anyway? That's the Temple Mount. Why would somebody call the brigade, the Temple Mount Brigade, Martyrs Brigade? That means they want to blow themselves up in buses. Exactly the same things that Hamas does, the PLO does. But one organization is not considered a terror organization and the other organization is considered a terror organization. What, what in the world decides what is and what is not a terrorist? I began to realize after interviewing with the BBC and many uh, media outlets in the West, I began to realize that there is definitely a lot of myth that is mixed with fact in our media. The beginning of the first myth is really the definition of Islamic religion itself, because most Americans think that Islam is simply another religion, you know, just like Buddhism, just like a Jehovah's Witness, uh, Mormons. Islam is just another faith like the other faiths. I have yet to find a single Muslim that would define Islam as simply a religion. All Muslims that I know understand what is called Sharia law. Americans. When 9-11 hit you and you had 3,000 Americans die, welcome to jihad, not the jihad that is the struggle within. That doesn't seem to exist anywhere in Islam. Now, welcome to Sharia, S-H-A-R-I-A, Sharia, S-H-A-R-I-A. Sharia is Islamic law. What does law have to do with religion? Does Christianity tell us if 55, 65 miles per hour, legal or not legal, or uh, the system of inheritance and this kind of thing? Does Jesus tell us how much to give for your children when you die, and what do you inherit, the male versus the female? And why in Islamic Sharia women get half the inheritance of a man, and their testimony is worth half the testimony of a male? These are all legal systems. In fact, in Great Britain, the legal system of Sharia is now part and parcel of the British government. The Muslims seem to have succeeded to split the British law in two sections. You as a Muslim, maybe you can go to an Islamic Sharia court and get your squabbles and your gripes solved in a different legal system than a British uh, legal system. Yet Americans don't th seem to see a problem with that. In fact, I'd say 60% of the Muslims in England, they want to have Sharia Islamic law. So is Sharia a religion? And what does that got to do with religion? These are legal systems. Most Americans don't even know that uh, Islam itself is a constitution. And dare we begin to gripe and bicker about our problems with the fundamental Islamic legislations and the terrorist acts that is committed by Islamists. Why? Because everywhere I look around me, I see an argument that says we must have interfaith dialogue. We must build bridges. In fact, the last guy I know who was a Muslim who was trying to supposedly build bridges with non-Muslims ended up decapitating his poor wife. And you had only had 70,000 hits on Google. If you Google his name, Muzammil, and his beheading case, you only get 70,000 hits. Yet when you Google the chimpanzee who mauled this woman, you get over 1 million hits on the internet. Had the chimpanzee been a convert to Islam, possibly he would not get a million hits. He'd get less, much less than that, just like Muzammil. Yet little wants to be said about that in the media. I don't understand that if you have a gripe with somebody, I mean, if, uh, let's say, crusaders have erupted again in history now in our front of our eyes, and now they are killing people, and they are killing Muslims, and Muslims are beginning to bring a case against the Christians, and the Christendom is killing us, should we put our differences aside and simply find what is common between us, they are, that we are all simply Abrahamic faiths who worship the same God? 
I don't think so, because when you go to court and you file a complaint to the judge, the reason you're going to court is because you're trying to solve a difference and not an agreement. You don't go to court to solve agreements. You go to court to reach agreements and discuss the differences and the problems you have with somebody. I can't understand if a court system, you know, a, a rape victim goes to court and files charges against a rapist, that the rapist can speak and the victim cannot. Yet this is exactly what I see when it comes to fundamental Islam and terrorism. The victims have no right to criticize the assailant, yet the assailant have all rights to accuse the victim of being an Islamophobe. I guess I'm lost. I still don't understand what is going on, but I think I have an idea and I have experience with this system because we are being demanded to say Islam is a peaceful religion. You must say it. Every American must say Islam is a peaceful religion. And if you don't say it, we'll kill you. It's simple as that. You must say Islam is a peaceful religion or we will kill you. In fact, the Pope had that same problem. The Pope made a statement. I don't have to give the exact quotes, but I paraphrase it. Islam must never be propagated through violence. Sorry about that. I did not turn off my phone. Let's talk about the Pope and continue the subject. The Pope said Islam must never be propagated through violence. Millions of Muslims demonstrated all throughout the streets, all over the Muslim world. How dare the Pope say what he said? The Pope should understand and know that Islam is a peaceful religion. Millions demonstrated. Everybody can see it in the streets, all over the Muslim world. Islam cutting banners. Islam is a peaceful religion. How dare the Pope say what he said? And expressing this peacefulness through sheer violence. Now, there's something wrong with this picture, and everybody in the West can see it in front of their eyes. Why is Islam a peaceful religion expressed through violence? And why you must say Islam is a peaceful religion or we will kill you? Is there something wrong with this picture? I mean, the way I break down Islam, I break down the Muslim world into three departments. There is the liberal Muslim who simply is and possibly an Iranian who immigrated to the United States and he's got his own business and he doesn't want anything to do with the, the Khomeini regime and he just wants to live life and pursuit of happiness and everything else. Uh, sure, he goes to pray five times a day. He wants to bury his dead Islamic way and he's not interested in no Osama bin Laden and in, in terrorism whatsoever. This is what I call a liberal Muslim. And then you have a fundamental Muslim, but that is in two sections. There are Muslims who believe in Sharia, uh, marriage, divorce, inheritance, testifying in court, uh, all sorts of arenas of uh, legal systems. Those are what I call a kind of somewhat of a fundamental Muslim. And then there is the fundamentalist Muslim, the real deal who wants to establish an Islamic hegemony globally whether through peace or through violence, because if you look at the Arab websites and Google Islam in the Arabic language, that is, and get an interpreter, you will read the facts. The Prophet Muhammad says that I have been ordered to fight all nations till everyone say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. I have been ordered to fight all nations until everyone say there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. Now, my American friends, what part of fight do you not understand? The same thing with converts. The Prophet of Islam said, whoever leaves his faith from Islam, kill him. Now, what part of kill do you guys not understand? I can't demonstrate, you know. But that's basically what a fundamentalist Muslim believes. Now, if a Muslim doesn't believe that he needs to propagate Islam through sheer peace with violence, if he has to, then I got no problem with that Muslim. But any Muslim who says that we must propagate Islam through jihad violence and through uh, basically what they call liberating, opening the 
countries that have not, not been Islamized uh, and liberating us from our air into the light of Islam through jihad, to me, is a dangerous thing, which has nothing to do with religion, by the way. This has nothing to do with religion whatsoever. In fact, you might think that this kind of thinking permeates simply uh, some fundamentalist societies like uh, Afghanistan, maybe. Uh, you can see that maybe in Somalia or in Sudan. That's not true whatsoever. I can take you to Egypt and show you the multitude of Muslim fundamentalists. I can just give you maybe an example so you can get the picture. I mean, you Americans here watch, uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Phil. Dr. Phil brings family issues, family problems. Maybe you have a spousal problem, with you know, children problem, whatever. And you can see all kinds of programs on Dr. Phil. In Egypt, let's say, for one example, they have a Dr. Phil. His name was Adel As-Sadiq. He was a psychiatrist, a psychologist, uh, you know, a family doctor, uh, somebody who comes on the national media. And he was asked the question about the martyrdom. Martyrdom operation. What do you think about, what's your opinion about the psychology of a martyr, somebody who blows himself up? And his answer was very interesting. He says, he, he called it the moment of the bliss. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Boom! The martyr now enters into the adobe or the abode of Allah. He now becomes an intercessor for 70 members of his or her family. He's now with the virgins. And this is on national television. With no one condemning him as a nutcase or as a crazy maniac or as a person who needs a psychiatrist because this man was the head of the psychiatric department of the entire country of Egypt. And the entire population supports what he says. Can you imagine our Dr. Phil here saying the same things and the community supports it? You not think that there is an epidemic and something is wrong with our society? But you might think this is far-fetched. It's not. Because if all of this is far-fetched in your opinion and could never happen in a normal society, let me remind you, Nazi Germany was a Western, fully-fledged Christian culture society that this kind of thing permeated even Germany and one of the most advanced countries in the world. It could, it could even permeate the United States of America if we allow certain amounts of generations of Islamists to live in this country and to brainwash our kids. But you might think it's impossible to allow the brainwash of children in America to this radical movement. Well, think again. In 150 universities across this country, in 150 top-notch universities across this country, you have what is called the Muslim student unions. Muslim student unions, with their agenda, they adhere to what is being propagated by Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, Hamas, Iran, all of these things. They support exactly the same regimes. In fact, they invite Nazi speakers. They invite terrorists, terror thugs, terror, you know, in fact, one of the guys that was in this Muslim student union threw a grenade in the first Gulf War and killed his own fellow Americans. He was in the Muslim student union, yet they are allowed to be at university campuses and being funded by the same tuition that your children have to pay for the university. So these kids can brainwash your kids into not being an Islamophobe. Because Americans, when they think about terrorism, they think, well, Terrorism is the explosive act. Terrorism is 9-11. There's more to it than just that. What about the political apparatus? Jihad comes in three prongs. In Islam, I used to be part of that system. First prong is the political prong. Second prong is the financial prong. And then the explosive act. What Americans are not doing is addressing the political prong the political apparatus of the Islamist movement. The political apparatus is the main reason why they have these student unions and is the main thing that we need to crush in America in order to combat this epidemic. Because this is an epidemic, it's a cancer, not only it will uh, kill itself, because cancer kills itself eventually, but this cancer will also kill us in the process. 
In fact, I wrote a book called Why We Want to Kill You. People ask me, why would you write a book titled Why We Want to Kill You? Because I wrote other books and Americans still don't get it. So finally, I had to come down to the bottom line. Here's why we want to kill you. But in reality, it's not only why we want to kill you, but it's also why we want to kill us. What do you mean why we want to kill us? Because it is necessary for the martyr to shed his blood in order to enter paradise. What's this whole thing about shedding blood and going to paradise? Why do terrorists want to blow themselves up and shed their own blood? Ah, oh, that's the part that you folks in the West don't get. The Prophet of Islam said that by the martyr's first drops of his blood, not only he will enter paradise, but he becomes an intercessor for 70 members of his or her family. Yes, her family. Women also can be suicide killers. Why? Well, in the West, you have something I can relate to that people preach the gospel. And now some of you might think I'm preaching the gospel. Well, I am, in a way. First of all, in the gospel message in the Christian Bible, there was one martyr named Jesus Christ. He shed his blood to atone for the sins of many who want to accept his offering. And if they accept his offering as, as he shed his blood as a martyr, then they will enter paradise. Well, in Islam, there is a similar message that by the shedding of the martyr's blood, he now atones for his own sin, and he also becomes an intercessor to atone for the sins of 70 members of his or her family. Aha! Now you get it. This in itself recruits millions of terrorists. So when my cousin Raid, a 16-year-old boy, decides to plant a bomb in Ben Yehuda Street in Jerusalem, and the Israelis, when they learned you have a bomb and you're trying to plant it and kill civilians, they usually set up a blockade and they shoot first and ask questions later. Of course, my cousin Raid was killed. My aunt Fatima, she had a wedding celebration. She started to pass candy in the street. Her house became the museum for the martyr. The entire community now could visit my Aunt Fatima's home and congratulate my Aunt Fatima, and my Aunt Fatima will give them candy for a festivity celebration because now her son is in heaven and he's interceding for 70 members of his or her family. Not only that, you have Posters placarded all over the street uh, like Rambo. My cousin all of a sudden becomes a Rambo with a machine gun there and all over the streets of the city. My uh, cousin's story is, uh, you know, talked about in the Friday sermons now. Uh, the entire community walks in the procession of not a funeral but a wedding celebration because now my cousin is in heaven and he is consummating his marriage with the virgins. You might think that this is madness. No, it's not madness. It's religious upbringing in the Islamic world that is prevalent not only in the Palestinian areas, but in many areas all throughout the Middle East and the Muslim world. You might think that suicide bombing is kind of a modern phenomenon. No, it's not a modern phenomenon. In fact, one of you know, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, his cousin, Jafar At-Tayyar. At-Tayyar means the flying Jafar. Jafar At-Tayyar, the flying Jafar. He went into the battlefield in the Battle of Mu'tah as the first one to kind of take his horse and just march right to the front line without the rest of the army even marching with him because he wanted to assure that he died in the cause of Allah. In fact, the story of the Bedouin who came to the Prophet of Islam and said to him, uh, what is this? Uh, the Prophet gave him his share of the booty from some battle. And he says, I'm not here to collect booty. I want to die for the cause of Allah. I want an arrow to hit me right here in the neck so I can die, so I can shed my blood for the cause of Allah and go to heaven. And the story goes like uh, the Prophet talks about it. And 
his wish was fulfilled and he got an arrow right in his throat, in his neck, and he died and his blood was shed for the cause of Allah. In a nutshell, fundamental Islam, this is why we need to address it as such, not just Islam or moderate Islam or fanatic Islam. It is either you are a fundamentalist Muslim or you are a liberal Muslim. Fundamental Islam really is a cult-like process that indoctrinates the masses in unison, in which you see Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah giving a sermon to the masses, hundreds of thousands of people, exactly as Hitler would do it, brainwashing the masses in unison in order to convert these masses to become remorseless killers and seekers of salvation by their own death. In order to look back to the glory days when Islam was triumphant and non-Muslims were subservient to the system, not just religion, but the system of Islam. So Islam is a cult-like process that looks towards martyrdom by the shedding of one's own blood in order to fight the enemies of Allah, to convert the world through peace or through war in order to make the rest of the world become do, uh, to, subservient to the powers of Islam. It is a war that never ended. It is a war that never ended, that continued from the beginning of the eras of Islam. No scholar in the world can deny that Islam was propagated by war. Well, name me a scholar, you can't. Uh, from its advances, whether it's Rashidiyin, Abbasiyin, uh, Umayyin, you name it, the Uthman, the Ottomans, all of them propagated this jihad operation to uh, basically convert the entire world into the religion and system of Islam. In fact, the Prophet of Islam had a prophecy. Most Americans are not aware that Islam is filled with eschatological, basically, proclamations regarding the past and the future. It's very interesting when you begin to compare these eschatological proclamations with what most Christians study in the Bible, you find out a lot of interesting things. But one of the proclamations in, uh, by the Prophet Muhammad is that uh, Constantinople will fall for Islam. In other words, Islam will conquer Constantinople. That was the, basically the Eastern Roman Empire. And they did. Uh, the Byzantium Empire, which was the Roman, fell uh, under Muhammad II in 1453, I believe. And Islam conquered Constantinople. The fulfillment of the rest of the prophecy is that Islam must also conquer Rome, and that is Europe. And this is why you see uh, Islamic fundamentalism being very, very active in uh, the European regions. There are many myths that Americans and Westerners even live with today. You know, terrorists basically distort Quranic text, that Islam is a peaceful religion, that the Quran says, La ikraha fid deen. There is no co coercion in faith. You must never coerce somebody to accept the religion of Islam. But most Westerners don't understand that the Quran really is separated into what I call Old Testament and New Testament. The Old Testament of Quran is what has been given in Mecca. And Muhammad, when he was in Mecca, all the Quranic verses seem to be peaceful and reconciliatory with Christians and Jews. And you can find tons of these verses like there is no compulsion in religion. Yet when you go to the New Testament or the Medina surahs, what Muhammad was told by the angel Gabriel in the Medina era, you will find them to be totally different, calling for the jihad against all non-Muslims, especially the people of the book. In Surah 9, it's called Surah at tawbah How ironic, the chapter of repentance Repentance from what? I do not know, but it's a chapter filled with blood. Surah 9 in the Quran that talks about, you know, lay siege for them. Who's them? The people of the book, just like the text says. Wait for them. Lay in ambush for them. Pursue the people of the book. Kill them wherever you find them. So on and so forth, all over. And so you have this as 
the reason why we, uh, why we, when I was a Muslim, why we basically had a war with the Christians, because the reason Muslims want war with the Judeo-Christian faith is for, you know, a very simple reason, really. With the Christians, the Muslims have a gripe, and that is the Trinity. What's this big deal about the Trinity? Well, Islam is Deen al-Tawheed. This is Arabic, the religion of Unitarianism. It's a very Unitarian religion. In other words, there is no Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Allah is God and He has no Son, He is no Father, and He is no Holy Spirit. He is such a unique unity of oneness that uh, you can never address Him as a Father or as a Son, as in the Christian dogma or the belief system. And the whole thing with Islam, I mean, Islam really is a polemic. It came for one reason and one purpose alone, and that is to supposedly correct the Christian dogma that believes that Jesus died as the Son of God and died on the cross. Yet it's very interesting when you, one reads the Quran or learns about Islam as I did, when you see some of the titles of Allah in the Quran, even regarding the story of the crucifixion, Islam denies the crucifixion in Arabic. They have neither killed him, neither they have crucified him, but it appeared so to them. Hmm. In fact, the Quranic verses in that surah goes on to continue that Allah basically deceived everybody who was watching the crucifixion to think that it was Jesus that was crucified, when in reality it was Judas Iscariot that was crucified. In fact, it talks about, in the Quran, it gives even a description of this Allah who deceived the people. If you understand Arabic, you understand what that means. Allah was the greatest of all deceivers. That doesn't seem to be like a title that is in the Bible. Because when I read the Bible in 1993, I began to see that the greatest deceiver in the Bible was the Lucifer that the Bible talked about. One of the names of Allah in the Quran is Al-Mutakabbir, the most proud one. How could God be the most proud one? Pride is my wear, Allah says in the Hadith. That's not the same God that I read in the Bible in 1993. However, now you might think I'm evangelizing to you. We need to stick with the subject of terrorism and fundamental Islam, as you think. You call it radical Islam. Let's just stay on the subject. Because many think that terrorism is caused by poverty. Maybe if we remove poverty in the world, then we will solve the problem with terrorism. One day I was given a speech at a university, and the professor raised his hand during question and answer time, and he said, terrorism is caused by poverty, Mr. Shubat. If we could remove poverty, we will no longer have terrorism. I said, excuse me. Is there any students in this university campus that come from countries like Africa or India? And one student, he had a big turban, he was Sikh, India, from India. And he said, I am from India. And you know that Indian accent? Sounded very cute. I'm from India, like that. I says, well, do you guys have poverty in India? And he says, oh, yes, we got lots of poverty, Mr. Shubat, lots of poverty. You know how that Indian accent again? I said to him, well, do you guys uh, go around blowing yourselves up as a result of this poverty in India? He goes, uh, Mr. Shubat, we got lots of poverty in India. We don't blow ourselves up, but they come from Pakistan, and they blow us up. Why would they come from Pakistan and blow Indians up? Because in Pakistan, they raised Muslim. In India, they have no reason to blow themselves up. They don't want to die for the cause of Buddha or Allah or that kind of thing. Poverty is not the reason for terrorism. And the other thing, myth that I deal with all the time, occupation, occupation, occupation. In fact, many of you who are watching this tape right now, who is watching this filming right now, would Think right from the beginning of my conversation, well, doesn't Walid understand the reason Palestinians blow themselves up is because of occupation? Did you know that three-fourths of suicide bombings exist in countries, Muslim countries that is, that have 
no occupation whatsoever. Nothing of that sort exists in those countries, yet they still blow themselves up. They blow, blow, they blow themselves up in Jordan. They blow themselves up in Turkey. They blow themselves in Algeria. They blow them, all over. They blow themselves up in countries where there is no occupation. So where in the world somebody comes up with this issue of occupation, occupation, occupation? Muslim martyrdom existed way before the so-called occupation of Iraq. And terrorism, terrorizing Jewish communities in Hebron existed in 1929, way before the establishment of the, Palest uh, of the Israeli Jewish state. And also the Palestinian state because there was never a Palestinian state. So much to be talking about the political arena. I know many of you will say, well, you know, he is pro-Zionist. He is pro-Israel. He is pro-Jews. This guy loves Jews. He is a paid uh, Mossad agent. I see. You claim that you want to solve the Palestinian-Israeli issue. I can solve the issue really easily. I mean, you want to call it Palestine, and the Jews want to call it Israel. Okay, well, let's just take the two words and kind of chop them in half and make it Israel Stein, and everybody should be happy. The Arabs should be happy because Stein is still there and Israel is still there for the Jews. Yet the Palestinians won't be happy. They don't want to, they won't accept it called, to call it Israel Stein, but I'm sure the Jews will not mind calling it Israel Stein. Yet there isn't a single map in the face of the entire Middle East that has Israel intact. But wait a minute, Mr. Shubat. I mean, the Palestinians basically robbed that land from the Jews. They basically came with weapons of mass destruction and just basically, uh, the Jews came with weapons of mass destruction, basically kind of wiped out Palestinian villages. Well, you know, this is only half the truth. Israel never came with weapons and machine guns and armada into Israel and began to wipe out villages. They were communities living in the land alongside with the Arab communities, alongside with Greek Orthodox, Catholics, and what have you, a litany of different Assyrians, and you had all kinds of backgrounds living in that culture, including Jews. And as soon as the you know, uh, Palestinian communities began to attack Jewish communities and you had some sort of civil war, the Jews began to defend themselves, and then when they did finally conquer their enemies, they began to destroy Palestinian villages. All right, no one can deny that Israel and the Jewish people began to basically throw out Palestinian villages all from this, from, from villages that existed there from a long time ago. That's true. But how often do you ever hear about the Jewish villages that were wiped out in the Middle East? How many Americans know of 850,000 Jews that were basically forced to exodus to the land of Israel from Muslim countries? Yet when it comes to the word refugee problem, you always think of a Palestinian refugee problem, but you never think of a Jewish refugee problem, even though the Jews lived as refugees for 2,000 years. For 2,000 years they lived as refugees. And the Jews absorbed the refugees, and we did not absorb our refugees to keep a sad case of a sore eye to the whole world so we can make an argument to fight them Jews. In fact, the war with the Jews is not just simply regarding the issue of Palestine whatsoever. In fact, it's an Islamic eschatology. It's been prophesied in the annals of Islam a thousand or so years ago by the Prophet of Islam himself. Let's see. لا تقوم الساعة حتى تغلب طائفة من المسلمين طائفة من اليهود قيل أين يا رسول الله قال في بيت المقدس وأكنف بيت المقدس. I memorized that by heart because all terrorists had to memorize this by heart. The day of judgment shall not come to pass until the tribes of Islam defeat the tribes of Israel in Jerusalem and the surrounding nations. And then the trees will cry out and the stones will cry out. There is a Jew hiding behind me. Come, O Muslim, come and kill him. Come and decapitate him. Decapitation is part and parcel of this all over the place. To us, decapitation was in our poetry everywhere. Why is this eschatological plan uh, the final solution to the Jewish problem uh, has been advanced by Islam? Uh, Westerners think that only the Nazis had a final solution. You see, the Holocaust really never ended. It never really ended. Simply put, the victims decided to defend themselves and establish a state and go home. And when they did, 
the Holocaust must continue. They must open their borders. They must never build walls. They must let us have entry points so we can get at their Adam's apple. No, the Holocaust never ended. Don't let anybody fool you. The Holocaust still continues. And Islamic eschatology provides for a final solution to the so-called Jewish problem. Now, many of you will argue with me and say, but wait a minute, Mr. Shubat. I mean, the Jews occupied that land. You can't even deny that. Well, can anybody deny that the Jews exist existed there two, 3,000 years ago? They were there. King David was there. Solomon was there. Jesus was there. These were Jews. But Walid, you can't make an argument of saying that the Jews can go back to that land 2,000 years after they lost it. That's an old story. You can't go back in history and try to reclaim something that, will lo that was lost 2,000 years ago. You don't make any sense. Okay. You have a right to express re your view, but I also have a right not to care about your view either. Now, here's what I have to say about that. Assume that the Crusaders defeated the Muslims a thousand or so years ago and took Mecca, Arabia, from the Muslims. And they still own it today. Would anybody dare say that the Muslims have no right to go back and reoccupy Mecca as the central focal point for their religion, which every Muslim, 1.5 billion Muslims, prays five times a day towards the black stone in Mecca, and they have no right to that land? I don't think so. I don't think there's any Muslim that would make such an argument. Because to the Jews, Jerusalem was the holiest place for them. No historian can deny that. They always look towards the east. And the Muslims always look towards Mecca. In fact, when I converted to Christianity, I remember my family, they called me a traitor. How dare you leave the religion of Islam? Well, I thought we were fighting about freedom. I thought we were fighting about liberty and justice for all. Why don't I have a freedom to choose whatever I want to choose? Second of all, I chose a man from my own village. I'm from Bethlehem. Jesus is from Bethlehem. I am a patriot. They were the traitors that chose a prophet from the deserts of Arabia, far away from the land, the Holy Land. So I'm no traitor. They are the traitors. Second of all, who stole my land? After all, when I converted to Christianity, it seems that my family had rights to take over my land and my property. I couldn't even own my land anymore. My last statement to my family was, who stole my land? You told me all my life that the Jews stole my land that the Jews occupied and stole my land. The Jews never stole my, stole my land. You stole my land. So don't tell me about occupation, occupation, occupation. When it comes to the issue of terrorism, there's only two choices you have as an individual. Either you make excuses for it, or you say there is absolutely no excuse whatsoever. There's only two choices. Choose one. Yet in the West, we began to accept that we could make excuses for terrorism. We don't make excuses for rape, murder, uh, somebody even that robs people with billions of dollars in the stock market. We don't give him excuses whatsoever. He even goes to jail, is arrested the same day he went to court for trial. There is no excuse for crime. But why is it only terrorism seems to have an excuse? Poverty, occupation, uh, hurt my feelings. Excuse me, poverty, occupation? Well, let's take an example. In the Palestinian areas, you have all kinds of terrorists. You have Hamas terrorists, you have PLO terrorists, you have PFLP terrorists. Have you ever heard of the PFLP terrorist? The Popular Front to Liberate Palestine is a Palestinian Christian terror organization founded by George Habash, a Palestinian Christian, and he's a terrorist. Yet till today, you don't have a single Palestinian Christian blow themselves up, not one. When the PFLP wants a suicide operation to blow up a bus, they always borrow a Muslim to do it. A Christian terrorist will never do it. But I thought both sides were under the same system of occupation. 
I thought both sides, Christian and Muslim Palestinians, suffered the same amount of humiliation from the Zionist enemy. So why doesn't both commit suicide and blow themselves up? Aha, uh -huh. because this is part and parcel of Islamic dogma. It's part and parcel of the Quran in which it says, do not think that the ones who die in the cause of Allah are dead, but are alive with Allah receiving his blessings. Terrorism is a response to colonial powers, to imperialism. And unfortunately, many of the anarchists in America and the liberals are buying into that, that America is an imperialist culture. It's an imperialist country that occupied other countries. And this is why we have terrorism in America. This is why we want to kill Americans. Not true. It seems to me that in Algeria, they got rid of French colonialism. And in many of the Middle East, there's no more British colonial powers or any colonial power whatsoever. So why is it that they still have terrorism even though they were liberated from the British mandate and the French you know, occupation? In Algeria, hundreds of thousands of Muslims die by the hands of other Muslims. Yet the Muslims never talk about it. They simply talk about the war in Iraq and the evil Zionist occupation. Don't forget about the Zionists. They're the most evil. Unfortunately, this evil Zionist permeates the Christian circles as well. Yesterday, I was looking at a Coptic website, Brit Egyptian, and they're talking about the evil Zionist entity. Arab Christians also have hatred towards Israel, Zionism, and the Jewish people. But I'm not like any other Arab. I'm probably one of the few Arabs in this world that says enough is enough, enough of Jew hatred. It seems that Islamism rubbed off on Arab Christians as well when you can't find any of these hatred that they harbor towards their Jewish brethren exists anywhere in the Bible. I mean, it reminds me of Jesus himself because Jesus himself suffered a lot. I mean, everybody agrees Jesus suffered. He was naked. It seems that six million Jews were also naked. He was starved nearly to death. You can see him in every, you know, portrayal of Jesus hanging on the cross. He is scrawny. And there seems to have six million Jews scrawny dying in starvation. He was imprisoned. They were also imprisoned in the ghettos, not only in Europe. They were also imprisoned in what is called the Malahs in North Africa. Why did they call them Malah? It comes from the Arab word Milah, salt. Because the Jews, after Muslims decapitate people, they had the job of salting the heads and keeping them as a display to teach the entire society how to behave themselves. Milah means salt. They lived also imprisonment in the Middle East as well. Hungry, naked, literally naked, six million Jews naked, not even... That the true story about Jesus, really, he had no covering in the waist like they show you in the movies. He was totally naked. I've never met a single individual that's volunteered to, to be crucified naked, hanging like that in that form in such humiliation. It seems that Jesus himself suffered like them Jews suffered too. In fact, in Isaiah even, it has a very interesting verse in Isaiah chapter uh, 63, verses 8 and 9. It says, in all their affliction, he, God, was afflicted. That he suffered the same way them Jews suffered. Now I think you think I'm proselytizing to you and I'm trying to give you the gospel. Well, I am, in a way. But I want to talk about terrorism. Terrorism are not minority as many think because they think this is just simply Al-Qaeda. No, 65% of Pakistanis support Al-Qaeda. 55% of Jordanians, by golly, for Pete's sake, good grief. The Jordanians are supposed to be a secular country ran by a kingdom. And 55% of Jordanians support Al-Qaeda, according to the Pew statistics. In fact, Al-Arabiya Network, which is an Arab agency, surveyed 113,000 Arabs in the Middle East, asking them, who do they prefer to choose, Hamas or the PLO? 73.2% chose Hamas over the PLO. Democracy spoke. 
Yet in the West, they have this thinking that if you invoke democracy in the Middle East, then we will have peace. That the way to peace is to invoke democracy. That's not true. Democracy is exercised in the Middle East only during the elections. And once the elections are over, democracy is thrown right out the window. No, beheading is not a modern phenomena either. The Prophet of Islam beheaded the Jews of Banu Quraida. I wonder, why would the Prophet of Islam order the beheading of the Jews of Banu Quraida in Saudi Arabia? There was no occupation, there was no Israel. Why kill the Jews of Banu Quraida? Oh, they betrayed the Prophet, you know. In fact, one time I asked one of the most moderate Islamic uh, 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 apologists uh, that was out there, you know, he was an activist. His name is Zuhdi Jasser. I respect him, and I still do respect him, and I like him. But what he said was interesting. I asked him a question. I said, you know, you openly condemn terrorism. You even speak at Jewish synagogues. But I have a question to ask you. Did Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, kill the Jews of Banu Quraida? He said, yes, no one can deny it. It's a historic fact. I said, well, how do you justify it? He pondered and he thought about this question. And he said, well, they had a fair trial. They had a fair trial. I said, the whole world knows now that Jews had no fair trial. Six million di died in Nazi Germany. They struggled all over the world for 2,000 years. The whole world came to recognize they had never had a fair trial. That's why they gave them a state of Israel. How come only in the Muslim world the Jews had a fair trial? Well, there's a problem. Because the founder of the faith himself killed Jews. So if you say they didn't have a fair trial or what Muhammad did was evil, then you have denounced Islam totally. And now you are an apostate. And the Prophet of Islam said, whoever leaves the faith of Islam, kill him. Let me ask again, what part of kill do you, Western folks, not understand? In fact, if you don't believe me, watch, uh, let's see, truthtube.tv. Uh, but uh, make sure you don't have lunch or dinner because you might throw up watching the details of how even the children are trained how to decapitate. You can see uh, footage of a child with a knife and the father is holding the chin of this Christian convert and the mother is holding the legs to an ant and whatever, the women are holding the legs like a sheep and the little child about five, six years old, ten years old, takes the knife and begins to hack on the neck and as the victim suffers he keeps hacking on the neck with a little kitchen knife until the whole head is decapitated. I guess when I read the words of Jesus, again I'm proselytizing, I guess when I read the words of Jesus when he said, I saw the martyrs who were beheaded in the name of Jesus. I guess that's John who said that. I saw the martyrs who were beheaded in the name of Jesus. That even the prescription of beheading was part and parcel of what will happen to Christians in the ends of times. I don't know what to say anymore. I guess uh, I am an Islamophobe. Maybe I am. I guess I am a confessed Islamophobe. I was a confessed terrorist. I was a terrorist and confession is the beginning of healing. Now I'm an Islamophobe. When I was a terrorist, you know, I was demonstrating in the streets of Chicago, carried the loudspeaker and, you know, yelled as, lo as, as loud as I can yell, who runs the Congress? And the crowds will say, Israel does. Who runs the media? Israel does. The day that I repented from my terrorism and shed the mantle of hatred, now the, the media calls us, not freedom fighters, they called me uh, a divisive, uh, xenophobic, Islamophobic, bigoted, racist, Bible-thumping Christian. Okay. Well, I decided to take that as a badge of honor and move on with my life. And here I am telling you really the true story of what happened and what I felt and what I feel now and I'll leave you up with a decision 
to make your own judgments. But building doubt about error is a good thing. And being dogmatic about what you were brought up with all your life is not a good thing. You need to examine yourself. Again, confession is the beginning of healing. I'm Walid Shubat. Thank you very much.